exactly what's going on in our heart, but we show him by our actions. Our actions speak louder than our words. We tell God with our mouths that we love, us, love him, but with our actions we don't seek him, and we tell him, God, I have it all under control. Now, I'm telling you, before you get too beat up by this message, I'm telling you, I was taking this one in the teeth all week long. God was saying, Stephen, prayer proves humility. How much do you pray? How much are you reliant on me? And how much are you saying, I have this all under control? The Bible says that pride comes before a fall, but God gives grace to the humble. Do you know that when we pray, God builds us up and he empowers us to overcome every situation that we face. Prayer proves humility. The second thing is prayer tests our trust or our faith in God. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says this, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God, that's prayer, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He says if you come to God, you first must believe that he is. He is what? He is who he says he is. That he's the king of kings. That he's the Lord of lords. That he is higher than all. That his promises are all yes and amen. And that he's more than able to accomplish all that he said he will. And not only that, that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When we pray, we're saying, God, I believe that you're able to do something about this situation. I know my boss said such and such, but God, you are the one that holds the hearts of kings in your hands. I know the bank said such and such, but God, I believe that you're Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I know the doctor said whatever, but God, you're Jehovah Rapha, my healer. God, my faith is in you and not in the situation that I'm facing. When we come to God, we can't just come out of religious duty and just recite something that we've heard. You know, you'll sit down and you'll be praying about your finances before you know you're here. Squirt out, God is good. God is great. I've, no, that's the wrong one. Um, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the, no, not, what, what was the one that I, no, no, no. When we pray, we're praying with faith, believing God, you are able to do all that you've said you can do. Here's something that blew my mind. How is it that we can believe God for our salvation, the most important thing in the world, but we struggle to believe God that he's going to open a job for us in the middle of a recession? We struggle to believe God that he's going to mend that relationship even though everything else looks like it's not coming back together. If he saved your soul, how much more is he able to do all things? He said, if my eyes are on the sparrow, if I don't allow that to fall, how much will I not give you everything you need? When we pray, we're telling God, I believe in you and I believe you are who you say you are. Yeah. The last thing is this, prayer proves our passion for God. Prayer proves our passion for God. Can you imagine if a couple just got married and they walked down the aisle and they said, I do, I do, no, I really do, till death do us part and all that different kind of stuff. And, and as soon as the pastor said, I now pronounce you Mr. and Mrs. Smell Fungus or whoever they are. And he says, dude, see you later, catch you at retirement. And he goes on about his business and she goes on about her business. What type of marriage would that be? Well, one that's going on in D.C. right now. But other than that, unless it's a politician, that's not the type of marriage that we would say is full of love. Ouch, right? <laughs> what kind of relationship with God do we have if we come to him only when we need him? But we never have a sense, God, I don't need anything from you. I just want to be around you. <laughs> I just love to be in your presence. I just love to hear your voice. I just love to be comforted by you. I actually, God, want to know what's on your heart. Yeah. When's the last time we went to God and said, God, I'm so thankful for who you are that I just want to spend time with you. Yeah. There were two women that Jesus went to their house with all his disciples. One was Mary. One was Martha. And Martha was like, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. So she started cooking. She's like, no, he's probably fasting. Oh, right, I'll make a vegetarian soup. And she started doing all this different kind of stuff for Jesus. And Mary, she just came and she just sat at Jesus' feet. 
and Martha came in. She was upset, and she says, Lord, look at her. She's not working. She's not serving God. Do you know what Jesus said? He said, Martha, you're doing what's good. You're taking care of your responsibilities. You're serving me. That's awesome. But Mary has chosen what's best. And I'm, I'm just thinking, Jesus is sitting there like, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm the dude who turns water into wine. I'm the guy who said fed 5,000 people with two loaves and three fish. Do you really think I can't make my own vegetarian soup? Why, why, why don't you just come and sit at my feet and spend time in my presence? I think sometimes our lives are so busy because we're trying to do what God is supposed to be doing in our lives. And God's saying, why don't you just come and rest? Why don't you come sit in my presence and let me take care of that? The Bible says in Isaiah 40 that even the young grow weary and tired. Even though we're not strong enough, but they that wait on the Lord, their strength is renewed. They rise up on wings like eagles. Do you know why you walk out of church feeling like you could take on Goliath? Because when you're in God's presence, all of a sudden he strengthens you. All of a sudden you begin to feel built up. It's not an emotional reaction. It's the power of the Almighty God resting on your life. And God says, I want to strengthen you every single morning. Will you spend time with me? Turn over to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Verse 1, and it says this. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he had ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I don't know about you. But prayer could be intimidating sometimes, especially when you're praying in front of people. You know, you, you, you know they're judging your spiritual life by how deep your prayer sounds. So, so you're like, oh man, here we go. I got to pray and you got to make sure you got to add enough heavenly fathers in there and, and enough almighty God. So it's, you know, almighty God, heavenly father, thank you, almighty God, heavenly father, for this day, almighty God, heavenly father, because almighty God, you are the heavenly father. And... and <laughs> And it's just this, this, this frenzy. And after hearing Jesus pray, his disciples are like, Lord, can you, can you teach us how to pray? How in the world, I know I'm supposed to pray, but how in the world do I pray? And God gave his disciples this pattern. And he wasn't saying, recite this, repeat this every time you come to him. But there's a pattern to how he prays. And I'm going to blow by it, but I'm going to show you first. The first thing is praise. He said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When you pray, when you pray, start off by telling God how awesome he is. God, I thank you that you're great. God, I thank you that you're awesome, that you're almighty, that you are the king of the world. God, I praise you. The second thing is purpose. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is, as it is in heaven. Pray God, I want to see your purpose come to pass in my life. God, I know that I have things that I want to see and I have things that I want to do, but God, so do you. And I put your desires above my desires. First praise, then purpose. The second thing, the third thing is this, provision. Give us today our daily bread. Now, I like this one because I feel sometimes we feel guilty when we come to God and ask him for anything. I always say this, and you've heard me say it before, I always think about my father. I literally have to tell my dad, dad, no, let me try to handle this. God, dad, dad, don't provide for me. God, dad, I'm the one. I'm getting them all mixed up. Dad, let me try to work this out on my own. My father loves me so much, there is literally nothing he would not and has not given me. The Bible says, if your earthly father is normal, how much more your heavenly father? Don't be ashamed, don't be scared, don't be intimidated to come to your heavenly father and say, God, I need this. God, this is what I'm looking for. God, this is what I desire. I'm telling you, he says, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. 
Let God know what you want. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says you don't have because you don't ask. If you would ask, you would have because God says if you ask, he will give you according to his word. Pray for provision. You writing all these down? Praise, purpose, provision, pardon. Ask God to forgive our sins. Forgive us our debt. It's important that we come to God according to 1 John 1, 9. It says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us of all unrighteousness. He said, Lord, forgive me for that bad attitude. God, forgive me for that wrong response. God, forgive me for cheating on my taxes. I'm going to do it right this time, God. Forgive me. Remember to come back and to lay our lives before God to keep a short account with God. Pray for people as we also forgive our debtors. Parents, pray for your kids. Pray for your kids. Pray for your kids that God would build them up. And I, I'll say this in particular, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on the parents, but pray that God would show that kid what they were created for. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how old your child is. When they find one area that they can thrive in, all of a sudden their confidence begins to raise. All of a sudden they begin to mature. They begin to run. And areas of their life that they struggled in, all of a sudden they put more effort into it because they have hope and confidence. Pray God, give them an area, even if it's sports, if it's education, if it's reading, it doesn't matter. It may not be their future, but just give them a place that they can thrive so that they can discover that God has placed gifts and talents inside of their life. Pray for people. And finally, pray for protection. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Pray, God, as your word says, your angels encamp around me. God, cover me. God, protect me. God, lead me in all that you have for me. Prayer is how we connect with God. I always do this 20 minutes on the first point and then we got 10 minutes for the last three. Are we going to make it? No. Some people said no. Have faith. Come on now. Point number two. Fasting is how I disconnect from the world. Prayer is how I connect with God. Fasting is how I disconnect from the world. Now, it's always awkward when you try to explain a commercial and you've never seen it, but I'm hoping you guys watch enough television to have seen those oil change sludge commercials. Have you ever seen those? You have a car and there's one with the, with the daredevil guy and he's about to make a jump up a ramp over these cars and he's driving and he guns it and he goes for the jump and all of a sudden all this gook just falls right on his car and stops him dead in his tracks. There's this other commercial where these cars are driving and the speedometer is going and as soon as it goes to 3,000 miles, a chain of oil just drops the car and stops it dead in its track. And then all of a sudden it says, if you don't get an oil change, that'll be your car. Take your car in or you will get stopped dead in your tracks. Do you know that as Christians, as we walk through life, we don't realize it, but the world affects us. The world begins to impact us. The world begins to desensitize us. The world begins to slow us down. And before you know it, it stops us dead in our tracks. I don't know why there are so many butt naked people on television. Yes, I said that. But it's like you cannot even watch TBN anymore without a Budweiser commercial coming on or ESPN. I'll sit there watching a the football game and before you know it, I'm like, oh my gosh, what in the world is going on? You turn on the television and without even looking for it, the corruption of the world just begins to infiltrate. And you know what happens? I'm just going to be honest. We become desensitized to it. We say, oh, whatever, the football game's coming back on. This world is just going to hell. And we just keep on going about our business, not realizing that it's affecting us, that it's desensitizing us not only to sin, but to who God is.